The recent history of Afghanistan has been filled with war and conflict. As a result, many Afghans look to the reign of the last king, Zahir Shah, with a sense of nostalgia for a time and place that was once peaceful and stable. From his accession to power in 1933 until his deposition in 1973, the country went through a range of social, economic and political changes. King Zahir Shah's reign saw Afghanistan embrace modernization in a bid to meet the challenges of surviving in a modern world. The modernizing drive of the royal family certainly succeeded in improving the Afghan economy and enhancing the state's capacity, but its policies and initiatives also unleashed a wave of effects which would ultimately play a part in the monarchy's downfall. In order to better understand the driving forces behind the socio-political events as well as the policy making that took place in the reign of King Zahir Shah, we briefly need to consider the events at the beginning of the 20th century. At the start of Amir Habibullah's reign, certain prominent families were allowed to return from exile that had settled in the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent. The two most notable families were the Tarzis and the Musahibans, Zahir Shah being a member of the latter. Both families were members of the ruling Barakzai dynasty. These families are important because they brought back an array of ideas with them, ranging from pan-Islamism to nationalism to modernization. Soon enough, these ideas were absorbed into the nation's infrastructure in the form of institutional foundations such as the Habibiya and Harbiya schools, which were set up with the intention of introducing a modern education, consequently allowing Afghanistan to become in sync with the frequency of ideas permeating much of the modern Islamic world. At the same time as these new waves of ideas were being introduced into the country, Afghans were also grappling with the fact that they were not fully independent. Their foreign policy was controlled by the British Viceroy of India. Such a flagrant imposition on Afghan sovereignty helped to cultivate an energetic nationalist movement that included the intellectual Mahmoud Tarzi and Prince Amanullah. In 1919, Amanullah came to the throne and took a more assertive stance than his father, going to war with the British in the same year, in the process securing total Afghan independence. Following on from this, Amanullah spent the rest of his reign trying to rapidly modernize his country, with the aim of making it strong enough so that its sovereignty would not be at risk again. However, this drew the resentment of a vast portion of Afghan society who felt the king was going against certain foundational principles of Afghan culture. As a result, a revolt broke out which forced Amanullah to abdicate in early 1929. The senior member of the Musahiban family, Nadir Shah, brought an end to the chaos when he ascended the throne later that year. His reign was to be a short one. The political scene at the time was still divided between pro Amanullah supporters and pro Musahiban supporters. In 1933, King Nadir Shah was caught up in this power struggle and he was assassinated by a high school student. Typically in Afghan history, the transition phase between one king and another was tumultuous. But that wasn't the case when 19-year-old Zahir Shah succeeded his father. This was because true power was not with the young king. Instead, it was with his three uncles, Sardar Hashim Khan, 
Sardar Shawali Khan and Sardar Shamamud Khan. They all had key roles within the government and tried to uphold their brother Nader Shah's vision for a slow-paced modernization program which would not upset the traditional elements of society. And so, for the first three decades of his rule, Zahir Shah exercised very little executive authority. It's important to consider that the Musahiban's grip on power was not secure just because of their status as royals. The ulama, the dominant religious class, were in a very powerful position due to their opposition to Amanullah. Therefore, for their own legitimacy, the Musahibans had to secure their approval. They did this by giving the religious establishment a large degree of influence over civic and criminal law. These concessions were institutionalized in the 1931 constitution. All of this naturally required the Musahibans to disavow the radical social reforms that King Amanullah had committed himself to. Nevertheless, the fact that they officially distanced themselves from those social reforms does not mean they disagreed with them. From interviews given to European newspapers before his death, we can see that Nadir Shah was a man with a firm appreciation for modernization. And quote, The fact that Amanullah's reforms brought his downfall does not prove in any way that they were bad. If in order to cure himself fast, the sick absorbed a potion tenfold stronger than prescribed by the doctor, he certainly may become sicker. That, however, does not prove in any way that the medicine itself was bad. The Musahibans were endowed with a modernist education, which they would have been introduced to during the decades in exile they spent in British India. But in order not to ruffle the feathers of the conservative elements of society, during the prime ministership of the eldest uncle Hashim Khan, the government focused upon a modernization program which almost completely revolved around trying to enhance their state building capacity. It did this mainly by trying to improve their military capabilities. This helped in two ways. Firstly, military modernization allowed the royal family to channel the modernizing drive that was becoming apparent amongst the increasing amount of graduates from modern institutions in that direction. Therefore, neither the modernists nor the traditionalists could complain. Secondly, it would strengthen the government's own authority since the army was an instrument of their power. And later on, if they did want to enact social reforms which would have drawn the anger of the traditionalists, at least they would have had a strong army at their disposal to push the reforms through. Tied to this focus on enhancing state building capacity was the development of communication between the capital and the far flung rural areas. This would allow the government to have a more direct role in those areas, partly through the establishment of roads that could enable a freer movement of troops which could then be used in the event of an uprising or revolt. Thus, the army would be used as a means to maintain domestic stability. All this focus on material rather than social modernization worked to the Musahiban's favor, because their very ascension to power occurred as a result of them being able to provide order in a chaotic environment. British military reports from the mid-1930s show that their power base was not underpinned by ideology so much, but by their ability to offer social stability and prosperity. As the 1930s progressed, the pro-Amanullah faction lost much of its prominence, thereby giving the government breathing room to focus on its economic modernization program. As a result of negative experiences with the British and Imperial Russia, Afghanistan turned to the Axis powers, Germany and Italy, for loans and expertise, 
This brings us to perhaps the most important factor in the reign of Zahir Shah for shaping the policies of the Afghan government. World War II. This might be surprising to hear, considering Afghanistan remained neutral throughout the war. But the Second World War forced a few pivotal realizations amongst the Afghans. For starters, the war placed drastic financial burdens on the populace, which triggered certain consequential debates within the intelligentsia. The price of basic items skyrocketed. House rent increased by 313%, clothing by 325%, foodstuffs by 361%, and all prices on average went up by 355%. As a result, World War II convinced Afghan modernists that reform was no longer a matter of ideological conviction. It was a matter of survival. Another important factor to consider is that although the misfortune Afghans experienced as a result of World War II wasn't necessarily the fault of the Afghan monarchy, it did raise questions of legitimacy regarding the royal family's ability to provide for the people's needs. In an evocation of the 18th century French Enlightenment philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau's famous social contract, the more progressive elements of the Afghan intelligentsia seem to have begun questioning the Musahiban's right to rule if they could not solve the country's staggering socio-economic woes. At the same time, the demand of the Soviet Union and Britain to cut ties with Germany and Italy in October 1941, a demand they had made under military threat to Iran and Iraq in the same year, would certainly have contributed to the perception that the country's independence lay on a knife's edge. And so, worried by the rising spectre of social upheaval, the Musahibans were forced to abandon their cautious modernization program. In 1946, the uncompromising Hashim Khan stepped down as Prime Minister and was replaced by his more open brother, Shah Mahmud. To offset a potential power grab by the country's intelligentsia, who were agitating for greater social and political reform, the monarchy decided to delegate a degree of authority to some form of representational democracy that incorporated the intelligentsia. This led to what has been referred to as the first democratic period. Whilst the economic impact of World War II may have been the trigger that the intelligentsia required to push for a system of governance that adhered to Rousseau's social contract, the intellectual tools required to appreciate the demands of the people on the monarchy were rooted in a longer term trend that began with the reforms carried out by Amir Habibullah and especially King Amanullah to build the educational infrastructure. The most prominent political movement that came about in the first democratic period was the Wikh Zalmian. Translated from Pashto as Awakened Youth, it formed in 1947. Most of its most prominent members were recruited from the major literary institutions. The movement had a broad agenda that was united by a liberal outlook which sought to enact political and social reforms. In 1949, the government announced that there would be parliamentary elections, the new MPs were electrified by the prospect of having a practical impact on the way the country was run. But as is often the case in third world countries that transitioned from an absolutist government to a representative one, the transition was not well handled. The MPs newfound power saw them try to introduce a torrent of new changes, which the political status quo was not willing to tolerate. In 1951, Liberal MPs in Parliament passed a law which ensured the freedom of press, meaning that journalists could have virtually complete freedom in what they wrote about. Naturally, 
This led to many uncomfortable conversations. By 1953, the government had enough and ended parliament. The last straw was when the MPs started to criticise the royal family itself. In order to assert its presence on the scene and stabilise the political situation, the royal family elevated the king's autocratic cousin, Sardar Muhammad Dawood Khan, to the position of Prime Minister in 1953. The mention of the Weikh Zalmian brings up an interesting and controversial topic within modern Afghan history, and that is the apparently prejudiced policies in favour of the Pashtun ethnic group. Within a very short space of time, the Weikh Zalmian fractured into various groups. A key reason for this was the movement's official support for Pashtunistan. Pashtunistan is a reference to calls for an independent state in the area of the newly created Pakistan that was dominated by the Pashtuns and was separated from Afghanistan by the Durand Line in 1893. For this reason, the Weikh Zalmian was criticised for having a Pashtun ethno-nationalist tone by some of its non-Pashtun members. This criticism has similarly been levelled at the Afghan royal family as well, who besides being Pashtuns themselves, patronised and cultivated the Pashtunistan idea. Pashtun nationalism was certainly an ideological force throughout the middle of the 20th century, both in Afghanistan and across the border in Pakistan. Nonetheless, whilst at face value the ethno-nationalist criticism of the Weikh Zalmian and the royal family is tough to undermine, we can get a more nuanced understanding of the context behind this outlook if we explore the events surrounding this period. For many liberal Afghan politicians and intellectuals, the Pashtunistan issue was used as a vehicle for undermining the autocracy of the Afghan monarchy. The critique of human rights in the new state of Pakistan opened up a discursive space for discussion of the same topic in Afghanistan. In 1948, the Pakistani ambassador in Kabul tried explaining this very thing to the Afghan royal family, telling them that their official support for the self-determination of Pakistani Pashtuns would invariably arouse questions amongst the Afghan populace for their own rights to representation, in the face of a monarchy that failed to give its people a voice in the government. For the Musahibans, the Pashtunistan issue was used as an opportunity to enact their vision of modernization on a tribal nation. The primary form of opposition to the monarchy had always been the forces of conservatism, epitomised by the tribes and the ulama. With the Pashtun tribes proving to be a formidable counterpart to government authority, the Pashtunistan issue was utilised by the Musahibans as a means of gaining the support of the powerful Pashtun tribes within the country whilst at the same time distracting those same conservative elements of society from the social and political modernization measures that they wanted to introduce. After 1953, the iron-fisted Prime Minister Dawood Khan would use the issue as a means of raising a strong army that could reinforce the authority of the central government under the geese of being able to protect the nation's sovereignty against a belligerent neighbour. A member of the younger generation of the Musahibans, Dawood Khan shared the outlook of many of the nation's progressives who wanted a quicker pace to modernization. Where he differed from the progressives was in his personal style of rule. Dawood preferred to govern autocratically and has been described by many as a strongman ruler. Over the next 10 years, in a period known as Dawood's decade, Afghanistan's economy gained a massive boost. The country had already put itself in an advantageous position because by 1945 it had accrued around $100 million in reserves thanks to the trade in Karakul. 
This money would be put to use in funding the modernizing projects of the 1950s and 60s. At the same time, Afghanistan benefited economically from the Cold War rivalry between the USA and the USSR. Even before the 1950s, these two states were competing with each other to gain the support of non-partisan third world countries. This led to the advocacy of a notion called developmentalism, which posited that it was the moral duty of well-developed states to help underdeveloped countries in the form of developmental aid. Prime Minister Dawood would have cared little about the ideological conflict between communism and capitalism. Rather, he welcomed the prospect of rapid economic development which could ensure his country's independence. In an interview with the famed American scholar of Afghan culture and history, Louis Dupree, Dawood encapsulated the urgency of Afghan modernists when he stated, Afghanistan is a backward country. We must do something about it or die as a nation. It is within this context that Afghanistan's economy was effectively organized post-World War II to become aid dependent. To tell us more about this, we now go to history with Hilbert. From 1950 to 1965, Afghanistan applied for and received more than $80 million in loans from the Export-Import Bank. This period saw the construction of the monumental but ultimately fruitless Helmand Dam. In 1955, when Soviet Premier Khrushchev announced his economic offensive, Afghanistan was going to be the benefactor of more than $100 million in credit that would facilitate Soviet engineers to construct airports, dams, factories and highways. Therefore, the country's rulers were obliged to utilize their historic location on the crossroads of Asia to find the best deal for their country by playing a game of accepting aid from both superpowers but not preferring one over the other. Over time, this proved to be a dangerous game, which helped lead to the Afghan-Soviet war of the 1980s. Thanks Hilbert! Make sure you guys go and check out his video on India's involvement in Afghanistan after you're finished with this video. And if you want to find out how Afghanistan's quest to modernize helped lead to the Afghan-Soviet war in the 1980s, Check out the feature length documentary I made on the topic. Despite all this economic growth, Prime Minister Dawood's antagonism with Pakistan over the Pashtunistan issue was evidently costing the Afghans. The tension eventually culminated in border closures between the two neighbours, which placed a major strain on the Afghan economy. Emboldened by Dawood's loss of support amongst many members of the royal family and the wider intelligentsia, in 1963, King Zahir Shah facilitated a scenario where Dawood resigned as Prime Minister. This brought about the Constitutional Decade, a period which similar to the Liberal Parliament era was characterized by increased political dynamism but also greater political chaos as well. Taking a more assertive role for the first time in his 30-year reign, King Zahir Shah sought to form a government that would introduce Afghans to what he called New Democracy, which would have Dr. Muhammad Yusuf, a non-royal, as Prime Minister. It was specifically in this period that the ideas that had previously been generated and subsequently proliferated by the Weir Zalmian and wider intelligentsia gained an added layer of prominence because Dr. Yusuf's cabinet was called the Cabinet of Educationalists, since many of its members were drawn from major literary and educational institutions such as Kabul University. The most striking culmination of liberal ideas being propagated by the intelligentsia and reformist politicians was the 1964 constitution which finally answered the call for a constitutional monarchy that was first evoked at the beginning of the 20th century. This monumental piece of legislation was made possible by the Constitutional Coalition, a group that included the king, the educated elite, the traditional elite, and certain elements of the royal family. However, 
Once the fear of Dawood's political prominence subsided, the coalition fragmented and a growing sense of anarchy perpetuated throughout the constitutional decade. Amid the increased political upheaval, there were four main strains of thought that could be detected amongst the newly active parliament. The traditionalists, who favoured a strong emphasis on Afghan culture and the retaining of Islamic principles. The adopters, wanting to fuse Western technology with Afghan culture. The Democrats, who sought a democratic republic. And the Marxist-Leninists, who were theoretically compelled to the revolutionary overthrow of a non-communist government. These ideological viewpoints gained greater exposure through various publications that came to the surface as a result of the 1965 press law. But any benefits that could be wrought from the proliferation of publications were undermined by the lack of official parties in parliamentary elections. Instead, the elections revolved around individuals which hastened the fragmentation of the Wolasi Jarga, or the lower house of parliament. The confusion was heightened by the Marxist-Leninists, whose publication was shut down for espousing anti-monarchic views, and they subsequently used their support amongst the university students of Kabul to utilize obstructionist tactics that included more than 2,000 strikes, demonstrations, and protests. The rise of communist political activity drew a conservative reaction from the ulama as well, a trend that would reach its apotheosis during the Afghan Jihad in the 1980s. To confound matters, a series of ecological disasters in the late 1960s and early 1970s that included famine and drought further undermined the government's credibility. Because of its failure to successfully mitigate the impact on the people, This led to a situation by 1971 in which the scholar Dupree predicted that revolution would seem no more than a decade away. Within five years, the first abortive coup may occur. Most likely it will emanate from the idealistic, unrealistic left. Robert G. Newman, the US ambassador, was even more negative, claiming in 1972 that the survival of King Zahir Shah beyond a year was, quote, problematical. His words would prove prophetic. In 1973, whilst the king was away on medical treatment in Italy, his cousin and ex-Prime Minister Dawood staged a bloodless coup that toppled the monarchy and replaced it with a republic that had him at the helm. The Afghan monarchy had ruled for 250 years, a line of tradition that had begun with the 18th century conqueror Ahmad Shah Durrani and ended with Zahir Shah, the last king of Afghanistan. As usual, I want to thank my patrons for their generous support, especially the newest one, Amar. If you want to support the channel, there's a link to my Patreon in the description to this video. Make sure you check out History with Hilbert's video on India's involvement in Afghanistan and how that could increase with the US withdrawal. Until next time, peace.